I'm Colin from We Learn to Share. Today's lecture is about atoms, molecules, and ions. To understand the basic concepts of atoms, let's start with atomic theory. In the atomic theory, there are three main postulates which follow John Dalton's atomic model. First, an element is composed of tiny particles called atoms, which have the same chemical properties. The atoms of different elements are different from each other. Second, atoms move from a substance to another in an ordinary chemical reaction, but no atom of any element disappears or changes into an atom of another element. Third, compounds are formed when atoms of two or more elements combine. We can define the atom as the smallest particle of an element that can enter a chemical reaction. Now, let's go on to the components of an atom and their discovery. Atoms are composed of electrons and an atomic nucleus consisting of protons and neutrons. Electrons carry a unit negative charge and have very small mass relative to protons and neutrons. Every atom contains a definite number of electrons, which vary from element to element. Protons carry a unit positive charge equal in magnitude to that of an electron. Neutrons are uncharged particles with a mass slightly greater than a proton. Electrons were discovered by J.J. Thomson in the cathode ray tube experiment, and they were the first discovery to prove that atoms are not the smallest particles that make up a matter. After the discovery of electrons, Thomson proposed the plum pudding model, which defined the structure of an atom as a positively charged sphere with electrons embedded. However, this model did not last long. In 1911, Ernest Rutherford and his students bombarded a piece of thin gold foil with alpha particles and were able to see particles scattering instead of going into one direction. By this experiment, he discovered that most of the atoms in empty space and all the positive charge and most of the mass are concentrated in the nucleus. After more studies, the components of the atom and nucleus, protons and neutrons, were discovered. All the atoms of a particular element have the same number of protons in the nucleus as they have the same number of electrons. This number is called the atomic number and is given the symbol Z. The mass number of an atom, given the symbol A, is found by adding up the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. Although the number of protons are always equal in the same type of atom, atoms from the same element can differ in mass since the number of neutrons can vary. These atoms that have the same atomic numbers but have different mass numbers are called isotopes. For example, let's look at the isotopes of hydrogen. Element hydrogen has just one proton and no neutrons, so its mass number is 1. Deuterium has one proton and one neutron, so its mass number is 2. Tritium has one proton and two neutrons, so its mass number is 3. The composition of a nucleus is shown by its nuclear symbol. At the lower left is the atomic number of the element. At the upper left is the mass number of the element. Isotopes of an element are often distinguished by writing the mass number after the symbol of the element. For example, the isotopes of uranium are often referred to as U-235 and U-238. The term more specific than the mass number is the atomic mass of an element. It shows the average relative mass of an atom. The modern atomic mass scale is based on the most common isotope of carbon. This isotope is assigned the mass of exactly 12 atomic mass units. The atomic mass of an atom 
can be measured in mass spectrometry by measuring the extent of deflection of an ion. To determine the atomic mass of an element, it is necessary to know the masses of individual isotopes and the isotopic abundances in nature. Isotopic abundances, as well as isotopic masses, can be determined by mass spectrometry. The relative abundances of isotopes are proportional to their areas under the recorder peaks of the spectrometer. After knowing the isotopic abundances and isotopic masses, we can calculate the atomic mass by using this equation. The periodic table, which shows the symbols of all elements arranged in a particular way, can be used to find the element's atomic number and its average atomic mass. Now, we know how to determine relative masses of atoms, but how do we find out the exact mass of a single atom? Avogadro's number takes a big role in this process. It represents the number of atoms of an element in a sample whose mass in grams is numerically equal to the atomic mass of the element. The mass of an individual atom can be determined by dividing the atomic mass of an element with Avogadro's number. The chemical properties of elements depend upon their atomic numbers. Elements tend to share some properties with the ones in the same period or group. Elements in the same period have equal numbers of orbitals. Elements with similar chemical properties fall directly beneath one another in vertical groups. Periods are the horizontal rows in the table and groups are the vertical columns. Elements falling in groups 1, 2, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18 are called the main group elements. In the periodic table, metals appear at the lower left and non-metals appear at the upper right. Between them are metalloids, which have the intermediate properties. The atoms we have learned about tend to combine in nature to form more complex structural units. Two or more atoms may combine with one another to form an uncharged molecule. Molecular substances usually involve non-metallic elements. The atoms hold each other through covalent bonds consisting of shared pairs of electrons. Molecular substances can be represented by molecular formulas in which the number of atoms of each element is indicated by a subscript with an asterisk symbol. Structural formulas are often used to represent the structure of a molecule as you see in the figure. The dashes represent the covalent bond formed between the atoms. Condensed structural formulas, the intermediate between molecular formulas and structural formulas, are also used to represent the molecular substance. These formulas emphasize the presence of reactive groups. Atoms can form another type of complex called ions. Cations or positive ions are formed when metal atoms lose electrons. Anions or negative ions are formed when non-metal atoms gain electrons. The number of protons in the nucleus does not change in the formation of ions. The charges of ions formed by the atoms of the main group elements can be predicted by applying this principle. Atoms that are close to a noble gas in the periodic table form ions that contain the same number of electrons as the neighboring noble gas atom. However, many transition and post-transition metals can form more than one cation and they do not follow the noble gas structures. Two or more atoms can form polyatomic ions. Except the two cations, the ammonium ion and the mercury ion, polyatomic ions are all anions. A majority of them are oxoanions and contain oxygen atoms. Ionic compounds formed by metallic and nonmetallic atoms are held by ionic bonds, the strong electrical forces between oppositely charged ions. Unlike molecular substances, 
ionic compounds have high electric conductivity when dissolved in water. This section requires a lot of additional information, so it will be helpful if you find the examples frequently used in problems and memorize them. Let's start with the naming method of ions. Mildoatomic cations take the name of atom they are derived from. In the case of transition and post-transition metal cations, the charge is indicated as a Roman numeral after the name of metal. Monoatomic anions are written by adding the suffix "-ide", to the stem of the name of the nonmetal they are derived from. Polyatomic ions have their own special names, and also anions have their own naming method. Certain nonmetals in groups 15 to 17 can form multiple oxoanions, and they are named by the following principle. When a nonmetal forms two oxoanions, the suffix 8 is used for the anion with a large number of oxygen atoms, and the suffix "-ite is used for the anion containing the fewer oxygen atoms. When more than two oxoanions can be formed, the prefixes per for the largest number of oxygen atoms and hypo for fewest oxygen atoms are used as well. To give names to oxoanions, it is necessary to know the number of oxoanions a nonmetal atom can form. The name of cations and anions can be combined to form the name of the ionic compound. Binary molecular compounds or molecular substances containing two types of nonmetal atoms also have a systematic naming method. In case of binary molecular compounds, which are the only compound formed by the pair of elements, the named method for ionic compounds is used. When two or more binary compounds can be formed by a pair of nonmetals, Greek prefixes are used to designate the number of atoms present. Many binary molecular compounds also have their common names, just as we call H2O water and H2O2 hydrogen peroxide. This is the end of today's lecture. To keep on the course, press the subscribe button, leave a like, and turn on the notifications.